All right. Welcome back, everybody, to the Journey of a Christian Dad podcast. I am so excited today. As a kid, you get to watch in baseball and you get to play in baseball and you get to just talk talking with your buddies. And I feel like Todd and I got to talk a little bit today and I feel like I'm just talking to a buddy about baseball and about life and about just how things work. And not only am I talking to another guy about baseball, but I'm happening to talk to a, a pitcher that I grew up watching and admired and I loved his competition and drive. And then on top of that, two-time World Series champion. And I've got to tie in with my grandpa. He loved, my grandpa loved baseball. So me and him always hung and talked about baseball. And of course, us being Cardinals fans in the 60s, the Yankees did a little something in the 60s too. And Sorry. your dad was a part of it. So I got to know your dad. So welcome to the Journey of a Christian Dad podcast. Welcome, Todd Stottlemyre. Man, I really appreciate it. I got to tell you, I'm honored. I'm humbled. And, and uh, you know, we have a mutual friend of ours that connected us and, and uh, you know, a thrill for me to be here and to be able to share with you. So I'm looking forward to the conversation. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Listen, what was it like being a kid, not knowing that you'd be in the major league someday, or maybe you just did at the age of three or four, but what was that like to be, grow up how you grew up? You know, pretty crazy. You know, it's like, um, you know, I, I look back and I've done a lot of reflecting. And of course, you know, when you, when you grow up in that environment, you don't realize just how special it is. Right. And, and, but it was when we were fart, when we were far removed from that environment, you look back and you're kind of like, wow, like that was really special. And, and, you know, every home game that the New York Yankees pit, uh, played, my brothers and I, we throw our Yankee uniforms on and we literally went to work with my father and his work being a starting pitcher for the New York Yankees. And, and we went to work with that every day and Yankee stadium was like our monkey bars. It was our playground. And, you know, um, to grow up in that environment and to be able to hang around some of my father's teammates and, and to really inherit uh, his environment, his friends, his associations, pretty crazy because it was like going to the School of Champions. I mean, when you think back on it, you know, he had teammates like Mano and Maris, Whitey Ford, you know, uh, Thurman Munson, Bobby Mercer, Yogi <laughs> Berra was his first manager. You know, you start rattling these names off and you look back and it's like, wow. I mean, and, and then at 40, um, when I turned 40, I celebrated my 40th birthday with Yogi, where he was celebrating his 80th birthday. We had our birthdays together. And I would tell you, even at 40, I was still in awe of Yogi. And uh, even though I grew up around the game, played the game, the whole deal, but uh, uh, it, was, it was incredible. And, and, you know, a dream was developed in that environment. And that dream was to follow my father's footsteps. And I thank God every day and just humbled and grateful that I got a chance to play the great game of baseball for a long time, following his footsteps. And, and uh, you know, it was a great run and I'm grateful and thankful for it and great experience. And, you know, to play on world championship teams is incredible uh, because it's a bond you create with the guys on that team that'll, you know, that bond is forever. And every time we talk, it's, it's as if, you know, um, no time has passed and even after all of these years and, and uh, so just, just really incredible. I'm really grateful and, and humbled that I got a chance to do that. Well, can you think of a story that just stands out for when you were a kid that's just so out there and different that other kids are never going to have an experience like that? You know, family days were cool. Um, you know, they let all the stands in early and, you know, dads would um, play their sons or their daughters. And, and there's actually, I got a picture of it somewhere. Um, I was running with my father in my Yankee uniform. And of course he had his on and ended up in a Yankee magazine. And, and oddly enough, somebody, and I was probably five or six years old, but somebody literally at that, that was at that stadium that day asked my father to sign the photo and ask me. So think about a five or six year old giving an autograph, right? And then, and, and I'm sure that fan just thought, ah, oh, it'll be kind of cool, a father and son on here, whatever, not knowing or not thinking that someday that I would play. But oddly enough, um, whoever that person was, uh, I'm grateful because they literally posted that and sent that to me and, and, and created an awareness like over just over the last year. So you're talking about 
this probably happened 50 years ago. But to think 50 years ago at five, six years old, whatever age I was at the time, that I was signing autographs inside of a major league baseball stadium, like almost unheard of, right? And and pretty yes. crazy. So it's kind of cool. You know, I look back on it, it's so funny to me. Um, and then to have photos today of um, of Mickey and where Mickey signed personalized photos to, uh, to my brothers and I. And, and then on those photos, um, you know, I was practicing my autograph. So I actually have a frame photo where Mickey had signed a picture to me. And then of course, then I signed it because I was practicing my autograph too. So maybe I had a vision or an awareness like this thing is going to happen someday. And, and I also think that because of it, I realized that when a fan wanted an autograph, just how special that was, because it's special to me, even to this day, you know, some of the things that throughout my life that whether they're my father's teammates or my teammates, some of those autograph deals and, and the memories of it is so special to me, which is why even to this day, you know, people send a lot of fan mail. I sign every card, every photo, every ball, um, honored to do it. I'm humbled that someone would want my autograph and, but I just realized how special it was to me. So uh, I think I have a better understanding of, of for the fans out there that want autographs and collect those, how special it can be for them. So, you know, that, that bridge is helped me bridge that understanding of the power of an autograph, I guess. Pretty oh, crazy. absolutely. Wow. Yeah, pretty crazy. And you talk about kind of the vision for the future. I was hoping to talk to you about vision today anyway. So maybe yeah. this is a good, good segue right into it. So I was thinking about Proverbs and it talks about where there is no vision, the people will perish. What are your thoughts on just vision? And we can go into it a little bit, but I'm certain you've got, you already brought up vision. So I'm certain yeah. you've got an idea that, that you'd like to share. So I, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in, in um, that what comes to your heart, right? It's moral and ethical. I, I, I believe vision. I believe dreams and goals. I, I, I believe they come from God. And, and when they're placed into your heart, they're not there to, for you to question. And I know a lot of people, unfortunately, will question, can I really do this? Am I capable? Um, and this and that. So, and it, and it kind of goes hand in hand with that when I feel that, and, and I feel that excitement of that goal or that dream or that vision. Um, I, I just feel like that it's from God above and that and then as I pursue that vision and understand that vision, that it doesn't mean that it's going to come easy. It means that you're going to go through some stuff. Right. And and as you go through this stuff, that all of that stuff is to make you stronger, to carry on and fulfill the vision, not to quit. And which is why I tell everyone all the time, I say like, you know, you have to have a no quit attitude. You have to be all in, you have to own it, you know, and, and God wants you to own it now. And, 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 and so you need to own it. And it doesn't mean by owning it, like I say, it's not going to be a picnic. It's not going to be a walk in the park. It's not going to happen overnight, but it's everything that you're going to go through to what you're going to become and what you're going to understand that when you get there, and what's funny about vision and I love about vision is whatever vision I have today, um, I ex actually expect it to grow a year from now. And the reason I do is because I expect to grow. And as I grow, my vision changes and a lot of time enlarges, gets bigger. And, and, um, and you know, it's funny, it's like this whole pursuit of becoming the best version of yourself. And as you're pursuing it, Whatever you think it looks like today, as you get on the road and you go down that road and, and you fall down and you get up and you got the scars and the scrapes and, and, and all of the things from going through the, the game of life I call the war. And, 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 but as you develop and as you grow, also that vision grows. And it's kind of like what I say to people all the time. I say, you know, think about the Olympics. It seems like every Olympics, someone breaks a world record of what someone said, this will never be broken. But somebody had a dream and a vision, and they had an ability to act on it and actually prove impossible possible, which is why I love to share with people that there is no vision 
that is too large that you can accomplish if you're willing to go through the war, the pains, the growth, the lessons, and you'll have a no quit attitude because I truly believe God placed it on you. You know, I believe that with all of my heart. Have you got a story of how you got there? I was doing a training with somebody once and I asked her what her vision was, what her goals were for the year. And she says, no, it's a two-year goal. And she threw something out there that was crazy, but I believed her. And she said it just real matter of fact. And one of the things she said was, well, if I miss it by a little, it's not that bad. It's pretty good. And, it would have, it would, and she ended up missing it by a little, but it was fantastic what she accomplished. And she gave me permission to set much bigger goals and dreams and grow the vision quite a bit. So that helped me a ton. My guess is you probably had to step into this a little bit also. Yeah, but it's not only what you accomplish, it's what you become. Yes. And the pursuit and going through the process, right? It's like, you know, today, if someone... If, if I meet with someone today and they say, Todd, you know, I always set these goals, but I never hit them. I say, let's pick something easy. Let's pick one thing. And let's not pick a year goal. Let's pick something that we can get done this week. And, and, and the momentum and the psychology of achievement will begin to grow and it will begin to increase and empower your beliefs of what's really possible for you. Here's the other thing. I see a lot of people, I always tell people, one year goals don't take one year. It takes momentum. And I'll give you an example of that is uh, two years ago, January, my father went to heaven. And it was, you know, it was, you know, obviously a sad day, you know, and, and for our family. And, and um, you know, he was my hero. He's my mentor, my coach. He was my father. But he was also my best friend. And, and um, you know, it, 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 was, it was tough. But um, and then I spent a lot of time with my mother after my father passed. I didn't want to leave her alone and stayed with her a couple months. And then when I left, I had my oldest daughter. She came in and stayed with my mother. And then when she left, someone else in the family, we, we kept family around my mother. And to this day, I've called my mother uh, almost every single day since my dad passed. I talk to my mother. I speak to her. And, and I just think it's important. But the reason I share this with you is because he passed away January 13th. I didn't work all of January. I didn't work all of February, March, April, May, June, or July because I was so connected to my, my mother. And it was part of it too was, is, is, you know, I was coming to grips with my father passing too. So I was also going through some, you know, some pain and some things of, of just missing him and, and, and him not being around. And, and uh, I started work August 1st. Now, here's what's crazy is every year around Thanksgiving time, I start working on my goals. I actually, I'm serious about it. So I actually spend about six weeks developing a plan and developing goals for the, for the following year. Now, here's what's crazy. I started work in August. And by December 31st, I had crushed every goal I had made. They were all one-year goals that I made in around Thanksgiving time to Christmas. These were all one-year goals. From August to December, I crushed them all because of the intensity of my focus and my work and getting all in when I got in. And they didn't take a year. Most don't. Most two-year, five-year, 10-year goals. Now, some of them could take longer. That's okay. But understand that Time is just a thing is what, what it takes to achieve a goal is momentum. You need momentum. Now, here's something else that's crazy. We can develop all the plan we want to. We can make the greatest plan in the world. And most of the time, it probably won't go according to plan because God's got a different plan. Let me give you an example. Two years ago, I said two years ago, January, January my father passed. Well, let me tell you, the Thanksgiving to Christmas time before that January, I was developing this plan. And I go through the eight forms of wealth. So I break down family, relationships. I make goals in all of these buckets, personal development, my spirituality, my business, my finances, you know, my lifestyle. I create goals inside of all of those and I, of which I call the eight forms of wealth. When it came to family, here's what I said. I wrote this goal that that between Thanksgiving and Christmas, time with dad. That's what I wrote. Now, 
Here's what I meant. I met me traveling from Phoenix up to the state of Washington to hang out with my father, to go fishing, to spend some, some incredible time um, with my father. That's what I meant. That was my plan. Here's what I didn't know. Time with father meant something different. And when I wrote it, I didn't know what it meant. Here's what it meant. God allowed me to have the blessing to spend 24 hours a day for one week inside that hospital, bedside with my father. That was the time with dad. When I wrote that, that is not, that was not my plan. My plan was fishing, man. My, 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 my plan looked much different than bedside talking to my father. And I would say to the doctors, can he hear me? They said, we don't know, but keep talking to pray over my father over those seven days, man. To tell him how grateful I was for his life, to how grateful I was to be a son, um, to have conversations with him, to say things in that seven day window that I had never spoken to my father. That was a gift. And that's, that was a little bit different plan than I had. But that time with dad, man, writing it down. And I remember I shared this with my children a year later because I was, I have five children. And I was talking to them about vision and goals and, and being intentional. And I said, but I, and I, and, but I said, but let me warn you about something. And you can be, you can be as intentional as you want to. You can make all the plans. I said, but, um, you know, and, and you can prepare all you want, but there's still going to be some things that could trip up your plan. It could develop into something else. But if you don't plan your plan, you're not going to be prepared for God's either. I believe this, that if you don't have, if you don't prepare for your plan, you're not going to be ready for God's plan when it shows up in your life. You're going to miss the opportunity. You're going to miss the purpose, the passion and everything behind it. For me, I didn't miss it. I planned time with dad. And I realized when I was in that hospital, that seven day window, I was like, wow, this is what it meant. This is what it meant. And I was like, you know, understanding and remembering, I wrote time with dad, I wasn't going to miss it. See, I wasn't going to miss the opportunity to have every conversation that I could have with him in that moment. And I remember I showed my, my kids a, a year later and I showed them the actual printout because I would write it on these big easel type paper and each section of my life would have its own. And I said, look right there, guys, time with dad. They all kind of teared up and I said, I didn't know what it meant. I, I know what I meant. I know what my plan was. That's not how it turned out, guys. But when I see time with dad, it was the, one of the greatest blessings because man, I got to be there. And I think about 2020, man, and I think about some of the people passing and whether they got COVID or whether they had cancer and they had to die in a hospital alone with no family. Um, or whatever they died from, because families weren't allowed in hospitals because of COVID. I think about my heart is so heavy for those families not to be able to say goodbye. And God gave me, he gave me that blessing to be with my father for seven straight days, day and night with my father. And I would tell you, that time that I spent with him was so special. It was, it was probably a thousand times more special than fishing with him in a boat. And that's, can you believe that when you think about it, it was, that was a blessing. I, I hadn't always looked at blessings that way, but it was a true blessing for me. So seven days, <clears throat> I'm thinking back to a time in my life where I had a similar experience, not my parents, but a, a close relative. I imagine there were other people there for some of that time. And with your background and everything, leading up to that point, my guess is you were probably the leader in that room. Yeah. Um, it was hard, man, because to be strong, right? And, and to, to be able to, to have that strength. And, you know, I didn't rely on mine, man. I, I was praying hard for strength. I was praying hard for endurance. I was, you know, I was pretty sleepless over that seven days. And, and, uh, you know, but 
God showed up when I needed him, man, in a big way. And, and, um, you know, and there was some, there were some surprise visitors actually. Um, Julio Cruz, who played for the Mariners, who met my father was a coach. He showed up at the hospital and he says, Hey, Todd, I don't know if you remember my name's Julio Cruz. And I was like, wow. He goes, he goes, I heard your dad was in the hospital and I just wanted to come see him. And I said, Julio, it's not good, man. I said, he's, I said, come in and see him, but I just want you to understand he's not going to be able to talk to you. He's not coherent. I said, but talk to him, man. It would be very powerful. And then, and then my father's last breath, you know, my mother was sick, unfortunately, with the flu and my brother was sick. So they couldn't be there a lot of that seven day window. Oh, wow. Um, but in the last day or so, my brother got a chance to join me and be there with him. And then, you know, we literally called my mother and the doctor said, it's time, call your mother, get her here as fast as possible. And we knew it was, we were coming to the end. And, and um, there's something special about his last breath is because I had my left hand on his heart. I had my right hand on his head. My brother had his right hand on his heart and his left hand on his head. And we sat there with him. And as he took that last breath, um, I felt it because I had my hand on his heart. I got to feel it. I got to feel his last breath. And, and in that last breath, I had overwhelming, overwhelming gratitude run through my whole body. And I was like, number one, he's done suffering. The greatest warrior I've ever witnessed in my life has done suffering. He'd been 20 years of going through this hell with multiple myeloma. He's done suffering. And even, even though it was so hard for me to say goodbye, it was like, to know that no more pain for him, I was grateful. To know he was going to heaven, grateful. And then to feel the type of father and friend that he was, was like unbelievable. And a lot of people talked great and said great things about him publicly, but teammates, owners of the Yankees said great things. Coaches, you know, people he, he coached under, people he coached for, people he played with. He was being admired by the city of New York, by Major League Baseball publicly. And here's what I'll say is my father was 10 times that man privately. He was 10 times. And you know, some people that are honored publicly are monsters privately. My father was 10 times the person as he was being honored publicly for his life and his commitment to people. He would, I would tell you that he was 10 times that human being. And, and I had this, this gratefulness was like, that's my dad. I got to live. I got to understand. And, and I got to learn from, and, and it was, it was, it was sad, man, but it was awesome. And I, I know that sounds really, really strange. And then over the next week, all I did was write in my journal, all the lessons, times, special moments, things that I'd, that I'd, that I'd gotten from my father, like growing up in Yankee Stadium, inheriting his friendships, inheriting his associations, inheriting his environment. It's like, wow, like what a gift. And, 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 um, and I wrote all about this gift in my journal. And then I eventually wrote a blog about lessons left behind and, and, um, you know, I cherish, I cherished it. And uh, I know it sounds, like I said, I know it sounds a little strange where you can have those different types of emotions of so much sadness, but so much gratitude at the same time. But gratitude showed up when I needed it and I needed it. Heck yeah. That's an amazing feeling. Um, let's, let's keep on that for just a second. Uh, Jason Angelette had been on the podcast in the past and his wife had passed away months prior mm -hmm. and he talked about his wife's death and he's like, I'm grateful she's in heaven. What have I got to be upset about or angry with God about? Right. I don't I'm like, how did that transition happen? And in his case, it was like just absolute faith and belief. And it was for me so powerful to be able to see that unwavering faith hmm. and it sounds like if well i'll let you describe it rather than me 
paraphrase it. What what was that like for you? That feeling when you're when you knew your dad had passed, whether it was that second or in the coming days or weeks. So there was. This is crazy. Uh, um, I don't think I've ever told anybody this, but so he just taken his last breath, and you know, the doctors are coming in and. And, you know, spending time with my mom and my brother and I, and one of, one of the doctors went to his bedside <clears throat> and kind of bowed his head and, and shortly thereafter he turned around and he said, hey guys, um, your dad's already in heaven. This is the greatest news ever, right? Um, and, you know, I got tears today and emotions today of happiness that that moment happened. Like, like he got the message, he said. He says, that I got the message. He's already there. And, you know, it wasn't always that way for me. And, you know, it's, you know, which ultimately drove me to write my second book, The Observer, was that as a kid growing up, and then, you know, I got to the age of 15, my little brother was 11. And he was battled leukemia from the time he was seven, and he was on his third bout of it. And the doctors said that the only way possible for him to live a long-term life was a bone marrow transplant. So everybody in the family gave, get, we, they drew our blood and I was the perfect match. And, and uh, you know, I got, I got the opportunity to lay down, my, lay down and they took all the marrow out of me and, and, and then in a similar fashion, put it into my little brother. And, and then Merrill, his body rejected and ultimately put him into a coma that took his life. And, and um, you know, for my mother and father to have to bury their 11-year-old son, I can't imagine. I got five children. I can't, I can't imagine bearing that cross, right? And, and but I lost my, you know, my buddy, man, my, you know, he was four and a half years younger than me. And, and, and I lost my buddy and, and I was so sad and, and losing my brother and, but I left out that hospital with two other emotions of hate and guilt and hate was, I mean, running through my veins and guilt had overtaken my body. And I was like, man, my marrow just killed my little brother. And, and then the hate, I hated God. I truly hated him. I was like, and I remember having conversations like what kind of God are you that you would take my 11 year old little brother from me? like didn't make any sense and and um you know and i battled that for a long time and and even though the doctors told me they said man it was like you did everything you could do it wasn't your fault and and my parents were like you know they were like you did everything you could do it had nothing to do with you that sounds really good but when a 15 year old boy is saying to himself my marrow just killed my little brother. Um, it didn't matter what anyone else told me at that time. And because I thought that, and because I had felt that, and because I replayed that, I became that. I became those emotions. And it wasn't until 12 years later. And uh, 12 years later, I'm playing in the major leagues. And 1993, we were just declared two-time world champions. I'm making millions of dollars. And from the outside world, if you looked at my life growing up in Yankee Stadium, lives out his childhood dream, two-time world champion, playing professional baseball, making millions of dollars, you'd be like, this guy's got it all. <laughs> like, there's the problem is when I looked in the mirror, I hated the person looking back at me because I felt the guy looking back at me was responsible for me losing my little brother. And I wouldn't let that go. And because of that, 
you know, so many times I was out of control as if, I, if I was on a mound and, and I lost control. Sometimes I get so angry, so much hate, so much guilt would show up. It would destroy the mastery of what I was trying to do in the present moment. It would ruin it. And I would sometimes even get that guilt and that hate was so emotional that sometimes I would black out and not even know what I did. Wow. And sometimes not just on the mound, but sometimes also in life. And I got... I got to a place in my life where I was like, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of feeling this way. I'm tired of these emotions. I'm, I'm tired of ending up mentally and emotionally in the same place. And I reached out for help. And the guy's name was Harvey Dorfman. And he was the guru of Major League Baseball, mindset coach. And I called him. I called Harvey. I said, Harvey, Todd Stottlemyre. And he goes, man, I've been waiting on you. And I said, Harvey, I didn't even know you knew who I was. And he said, oh, yeah. And I said, Harvey, I said, I need help. He goes, I know. And we booked a two hour meeting in a hotel room that lasted 12 hours. <laughs> in the first hour of the meeting, he said, Todd, would you do it again? And I said, do what? And uh, he said, would you give a bone marrow transplant to your little brother again? And I just melted emotionally. And I said, man, I do it every minute, every hour. I do it every day. I do it every day the rest of my life. And he got really close to me, looked deep into my eyes. He said, didn't you already do that? I said, yeah. He said, did you do everything you could do? Po humanly possible. I said, yeah. Here's what he said to me. He said, you're not God. You didn't have the power to save him. And you also didn't have the power to take him. He said, it is time you forgive you and let this thing go. You didn't, you're not God and you didn't have the power. So the first time that someone gave me permission, just let it go. You already did everything you could. You can't play God. You can't control everything. And I let, and I mean to tell you, I bawled like a baby and we hugged and we ended up laughing. And, and then in the last hour of that, that same deal, he says, we go on a seven day challenge with me. And I said, yeah. And he says, for the next seven days, you're not allowed to compete, no ego. You're not allowed to respond. He said, the only thing I want you to do the next seven days in your life, no matter what happens to you, is you got to stand back from it. And I want you to observe how you're thinking. And I want you to observe how you're feeling in these moments. And he says, you are not, he, said, he kept saying, Todd, you are not allowed to react or respond. He says, the only thing you can do is journal and observe. <laughs> I said, deal. And he goes, and at the end of the seven days, we're going to go through that journal. We're going to start to develop principles and models to help you, to help you not, not get to a place of so much hate and guilt and blackout. We're going to try, we're going to get, we're going to create models to help you not only get into peak performance, but to be able to stay in a place of peak performance, not only on the field, but off the field. And I was all in on this. And I got to tell you that, and it was a journey and it's a journey today. I'm, this is like, this was 1993. Here we are in 2021. I'm still on that journey of mastering my thoughts and mastering my emotions, but he gave me very simple things that I could practice and do all over time and be able to be able to change my state of men, my mental or my emotional state at literally the snap of a finger can be able to change it and give me the tools to be able to do it. It was so important to me because I was blowing up on a baseball field, but I was blowing up in the game of life. And he found a way that I could control those and switch those states and emotions. See, here's what happened. I had wired into my circuitry, the neuroscience. I didn't even understand. Look, no one was talking science back in 1993, but the 12 years prior to that, I had told myself something over and over and over and had felt the pain of it that I became it. In the Bible, it says, those thoughts you become. I became the murderer. I became the killer. And along with it, I got the guilt and the emotions of being the killer because that's who I became on the inside. See, on the inside, I was so broken, so dark, and I needed healing. And Harvey was the, he was like the guy that, ultimately saved my life and got me going down a different path but ultimately it was it was think about it it was like god was intervening in my life so many times 
And I remember I played with a teammate, Darren Holmes. He says, when are you going to let it all go? And I said, let what go? He said, stop trying to control everything. And there's power in surrendering to the Lord. There is so much power because here's what's funny. All those plans we're battling, they're better plans. If we would just surrender, there's a better plan with less pain. It's the craziest thing. But as humans, we try to control. And I was, I was caught up in trying to control everything because, see, when I lost my little brother, I had, I had no control. And I hated that. I hated I couldn't control it. And because I couldn't control it and because of the pain of losing him, everything I, that I entered into in life thereafter, I tried to control. And when I couldn't, what would show up? Hate and guilt, it would show up. So um, it's, been, it's been a hell of a journey. It has, been, it has been awesome to say the least. And I wrote the book because I'm like, there's other people out there that I'm sure that maybe there's someone out there that hasn't forgiven someone else or hasn't forgiven themselves. And my message is without it, you can't have freedom. See, I got to a place of total forgiveness. And, and, and it's like forgiveness is freedom. And God tells us like to, he's the most forgiving, right? And loving God in the world that it doesn't matter what you do, you forgive. But yet, why are we holding other people hostage? <laughs> when yeah. our mentor, right? And our mentor and our teacher and, and, and our savior is forgiven us for everything else. But why are we hold hostage? And without and, and until we forgive that, we don't, we're not allowed to be, we're not free. And I started to feel this freedom because of forgiveness. And it was just so powerful. And uh, so uh, I know, I, I, and, and once again, I, I wrote this book because I know there's people living in pain. And, and if you look at 2020 and you look at our political wars, our race wars, and you look at the wars and people's opinions on COVID, and, and what, you'll, what you see when you look back on that, you see people reacting, knee-jerk reaction with hate, with like, and I'm like, man, see, we're not responding. Responding would be step back, let me understand, let me respond. Reacting, and when we react, see, what I was doing was always reacting to situations, and it was who I really was on the inside. See, when we react with hate, it's not, it's not what we're hating on the outside. There's something we got to fix in on the inside. And that's the reason I wrote the book. Oh, because that is my misery and overcoming it and being on the journey um, has, become, has become really my, my ministry for trying to help people that are living in pain, that are staring at the ceiling at three in the morning. And I also wrote the book because I wanted people to understand that everything's possible. And that, that vision that we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. that it's about taking massive action. It's about learning. It's about failing. It's about getting knocked down. It's about, you know, but it's about all of those things that all, all that whole process is about growing. And I don't know who said it, but they said that life doesn't happen to you. It happens for you. What a perspective that this failure that I'm going through right now, the struggle I'm going through right now is not happening to me. It's happening for me. What am I supposed to learn right here? What is it that I'm supposed to learn? What am I supposed to get from this to become something better because of it? Powerful. Oh, man, you said so much there. One thing I do want to go back to, because I think it's pivotal, pivotal to change. So you mentioned control. Uh, obviously, uh, anybody that ever watched you pitch, just ultimate bulldog and competitor and, you know, man's man. And, but Harvey said, here's the challenge. Don't react, don't respond, only journal. And I laugh when you said that, because I'm thinking to myself uh, of Harvey telling that to me. I'm like, no way, man. I don't want to do that. I got some other stuff I want to do, such as react and respond. I'll yeah. journal later. Yeah. Yeah. I was in so much pain. And I think I was internally living in so much darkness. I was willing to do anything. Um, and I maybe with 11 hours of connection building and the pain yeah. you were in and everything, and you were at that point, you said, okay, cool, man. 
Well, I went into that conversation also trusting him because I had other major league players that I confided with that said he was going to, he would be great for me. So I went into it with the ultimate trust because of the guys he'd worked with prior to ever getting to me. So having that trust and then living in this pain in this place of darkness, I wanted out so bad I would do anything. And a seven day challenge to me sounded like nothing. Nothing. Yeah. 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 Even though it's like, think about it. No ego can't compete. Um, can't try to control anything. Can't contribute an opinion. Just got to document it. And, and, and I looked at that and he was like, look, this is going to be a challenge. And I'm like, yeah, but I, I Look, that challenge, the pain of going through a seven-day challenge wasn't even close to the pain that was going on in the inside of me. That inside of me was so painful. So so, so surrender, guys. Just stop. Surrender. Let it go. I always say now, now my, my phrase today is let go and let God. Yeah. I'm like, how cool is that? All right, God, you got this. <laughs> go get them, right? <laughs> I'm right behind you. It, I'm at greatest partner in the world to go through anything and everything. And uh, for me, it's like, it's peace, man. And, you know, we talked about dying. We talked about, you know, we've said, it's like, you know, when you get to that real understanding, it's like, yeah, maybe the physical body dies, but the spiritual body gets to live forever. I mean, how cool is that to have eternal to know that I see my dad again, my brother again, that we'll have a moment again, we'll have time again. It's like, come on, man. It's like, we're just moving on. When you get to a, and really understand, you know, what God has done for us, it's like, we get to move on to somewhere better. It's not worse. <laughs> so so much better, we can't even imagine. It should, and, and, you know, and a lot of times people will talk about, you know, when someone dies, it's about, you know, let's do a celebration of life. That's how it should be. <laughs> it's kind of like you get to move on. You get yeah. to move on to somewhere better. You get to move on to the kingdom. You get to you get to move on to no more pain. You get to move on to no more jealousy. You get to move on to no more ego. You get to move. On. I mean, it's like, geez, that sounds pretty good, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, it's like that doesn't sound so bad. It should be a celebration of life. It should be. You know. So I was, I was talking to another guy that played in the major leagues and I said, hey, I'm going to talk to Todd coming up. And he goes, oh, Todd, <laughs> Todd, Todd yeah. talked to Harvey. I said, oh, you know about Harvey? Yeah. Like Harvey really did some stuff for Todd. Yeah. I said, oh, how do you know about Harvey? And he goes, man, everybody knows about Harvey. Yeah. And he goes, Harvey helped me too. He goes, but Harvey really helped Todd. So that was cool. And, I, no. and, a, and a question about that, an hour into your conversation, he brings up God. Yeah. That was God's plan, not yours. And then he also said something else about God. Like, so I don't know, one, if he knew you were a believer and were angry at God. And two, if he, if he, if he was a believer at all, maybe he was. Yeah. And, and I believe he was. And rest in peace, Harvey. And yeah. Harvey changed my life, but. You know, and he looked at me and he had this growl in his voice. He's like, you're not God. You didn't have the power. Let it go, champ. And it was awesome. <laughs> you know, and there was, you know, and, and I mean, here's what's amazing about Harvey. Like, from that moment, he never left me. Like, we were in contact all throughout my career. And, you know, Harvey really helped me because it's like sometimes in a game, a major league game, you know, something, something might be going on in that inning, you know, runners on base, whatever. And he would always, you know, really hammer me at getting present, like really present. And getting present meant that anything that had happened up, up until this current breath we can't do anything about and he would tell me he said the only thing that you can control is this pitch this next pitch 
this next moment and what you're going to do with it. And then he would say, and Todd, the second the ball would leave your hands, you are no longer in control until the next pitch. And it was like, you know, as we go through life, and then I have my father who is this great reminder of this, that um, my father didn't waste one ounce of energy on something he couldn't control. And I, and I remember just even when we were kids growing up and, and being up in the mountains in this winter storm and, and being in a, in a trailer and, 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 and a camper and, and trees falling and, you know, snowstorm blizzard and, and my dad sleeping, snoring. And me and my older brother, Mel Jr. are like, how does he sleep during this? And we would wake him up and we're like, dad, like, and he says, listen, guys, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> like, and he would say, like, you might as well get your rest. He says, because if you stay up all night, I'm going to be the only one rested tomorrow. And he says, you guys are <laughs> going to be worn out. And he says, whether you sleep or you're awake, he says, you, you're not in control. If, if a tree falls on our camper, it is what it is, guys. And he was kind of like, like, almost like what? I mean, it was so natural to him. Like, what's wrong with you guys to sit up and worry about something you can do nothing about? And, and then to have Harvey in my life later on saying, like, let it go. And to focus on what you, on what you, you know, you can do something about. Not necessarily control, but on something that you can take action towards, right? And it's like, you know, when that ball leaves my hand, I'm not in control of what the batter does with it. I'm not in control of what the umpire, whether he calls it a ball or strike. I mean, I'm not in control whether the catcher catches it. I'm not in control if the batter hits a ball to the shortstop. I'm not in control of the shortstop now what he's going to do with it. I'm not in control when he throws it to the first baseman what the first baseman's going to do with it. What am I in control of? Only the next pitch. <laughs> so why spend so stinking much time stressed out, worrying about focusing on things we can't control? I, see, I didn't just need that in my baseball career. I needed that in my life. It's like, where am I spending so much energy, so much focus, so much attention on something in the past that is destroying me that I can no longer control and that my way out was forgiveness. My way out was understanding. I'm like, wow, you know? And when you think about it, when you step back from it, you look back on it, you say, so simple, but so hard. Was so yeah, absolutely. Because I buried this for more than a decade. I see, I replayed that story over and over so many times. That's where, you know, you see these people that, you know, they can build a story in their minds and then call it truth when it's not. Because we play it so many times, it actually becomes our truth. And my truth was darkness, you know, so... Um, you think anybody helped you create that story? Maybe the devil? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was at work on me all the time. <laughs> you know, it's like I laugh because, you know, you, had, you know, every day, man, you got to put on your armor. You got to you got to put the uniform on. You got to because, you know, he's under attack. And, you know, you know, the, the devil doesn't like you giving glory to God either. So he's like, OK, I'm going to get you now. Like, there's a great chance that I'm going to be tested after this podcast. I got to be prepared. I got to be intentional. You know, I got to I got to read the proverb of the day. I got to say my prayers. I got to put the armor of God on because he's going to he can come try to get me after sharing all of this with you. Yep. because he's going to come say, oh, yeah. Oh, you want to give it all to him, huh? Let me just see if you're real. And now here we go. You know, it's like my wife and I got a chance to speak, you know, at a, at a Bible study at our, at our church. And they asked us to be speakers about our marriage. And, and I told the, uh, uh, I told the pastor, I, I tried to blow him off. <laughs> and my wife said, why aren't you answering him? I said, I don't know if I want to do it. And she goes, why not? I don't understand. I said, because the second we leave the stage, we're going to be tested. The devil is going to be after us. I go, 
everything is too good right now. I don't want his test. <laughs> I don't want, <laughs> you know, because we're human and because we fall and we cave in. And especially if you're not, if you're not walking right. And it's like, and if you're not, I call it active prayer where you're praying everywhere you go. It's like, there's a prayer going on, man. And, and being connected. Um, and because, because of our human nature, it's like, it's so easy, you know, I'll give you an example is, is, um, you know, someone said about my, had a bad comment to say about my father on Facebook that my mother made me be aware of 24 hours ago. Oh, wow. I didn't have godly thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't either, Todd. I, I, listen, I, I was like, and I told my mom, I said, mom, just leave it alone. And, and, and she was trying, but you know, and I was like, and I, I had to go right into prayer because, you know, how I really wanted to respond was awful. Yeah. The thoughts I was really having because the, you just attacked my father who's not even here, not even alive today here. He's not even here. You're going to attack someone that's not even here. And it's my family. I had the most ungodly thoughts and emotions for a moment. Now, here's what's awesome. For a moment in the past, I know how I would, what I would have done. I know how I would have acted. I would have carried it out. And then I wouldn't have stopped because then it would have been a banner. I wouldn't have let it go. It would have kept me up at night. I mean, I would have been, I would have been brutal. Listen, I would have gone for the throat, the juggler. It would have been kill and destroy, right? It would, it would have been awful. And then at some point I would have come out of that emotion and look back on it and say, and then I would have had regret. Yeah. And this is where Harvey helped me. And it's like, see, when you can be aware and have clarity and identify that bad negative thought and those feelings, he gave me a tool we called the 180 degree mindset. Is this a productive? Is this negative? Is this emotional? Is, is it taking me to a different state? I went into an angry state when, when, when I seen this guy's comments. I went into a different state. I went into fight, fight or flight state. I want to kill and destroy state. And I'm like, whoa, time out. Let me pull back. And it's like, it's okay. You walk into a baseball stadium, half the people hate you, half the people love you, half the people are with you, half of them are against you. It's okay. It's okay. They have their opinion. They're allowed. It's not my opinion. <laughs> it doesn't make them an awful person. And it's like, and I 180 degree mindset. And then I started talking to my mom. I said, mom, ignore it. We can't let the naysayers get to us. We can't, we can't let them. It, it doesn't have anything to do with our relationship with dad. I said, mom, it doesn't have any, his comments have nothing to do, has nothing to do with your relationship for your husband that you cherished and honored and respected. Doesn't matter. And, but in the past, I'm going to war. Today, 180 degree mindset. And it's like, if you don't like the thought, change the thought. 180 degrees, start to focus your energy on a positive thought. And where I take my mind, I take my body. And where I take my body, I take my mind. And they're equally connected and they work back and forth. So is my emotions leading me mentally or mentally am I leading my body emotionally with a negative thought? Harvey was like, look, in those moments where you have this negativity and this, all of this stuff going on, Todd, call time out. Put yourself in time out as an adult. <laughs> change the thought. Change the focus. Meditate on the positivity. And you start to feel it. And now go take action. And it can be as simple as we've, and he used to teach me about breathing. And it's funny that there's so much science around breathing now and how breathing is connected to our nervous system that I can calm my body by breathing a certain way. I can energize my body by breathing a different way. 
And it's like, wow, the awareness of these things is so powerful. Um, you know, yeah, talk, talk about like the specifics of whatever you you've learned over time. I was just running earlier this morning, ran one of the fastest times of my life. Mm. And in the middle of that, I'm like, I got to control my breathing because I'm going to tire out if I keep breathing. Yeah. Like I suddenly became aware there was the wrong breathing pattern. I'm not a great runner, yeah. <laughs> but I distinctly knew I was doing it wrong at that particular moment. Yeah. But breathing is huge. Well, yeah. So one of the things, if you breathe through, breathe in and out through your mouth, right. And a lot of people do, it's like, you know, um, without breathing through your nose, inhaling through your nose, all that oxygen never, never actually gets into your brain. Right. And, and, and centralizes the whole oxygen of, of this to allow to um, go from overwhelm or stress, right. To some being calm, deep breathing, deep in, inhale deep exhale through your mouth begins to relax your body i would do it before every pitch sometimes especially in big situ situations and you'll see pitchers do it a lot or a hitter do it a lot before he steps in the box it's like okay i'm ready or okay now i'm ready right and it's like you relax your body but your mind is still has the intensity of the focus so now you can deliver that pitch or deliver that swing fluid and be the best you can on it. So breathing can be an X factor to high performance and peak states. So if you don't like the state you're in, if I'm feeling stressful, if I'm feeling anxiety and anxiousness and overwhelm, it's like lots of times I feel it in the business world as I'm going through day-to-day -day life and I'll go put myself in, call time out, put myself in a quiet place by myself and just start focusing on my breathing and literally just relax my entire body and then regain a focus on something positive and get back to work. And, um, you know, Harvey gave me permission to call time out on myself, put myself in time out. And, and it's like, and if you step back from it and you observe that thought, here's the question. Is it a productive thought? Can I do something about it? Is it helping me get where I want to go? And if it's no, 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 then change, Harvey would say, Todd, change the channel. And you change the channel by changing the thought. And as you change the thought, you begin to change your state. And it was so powerful to me. That is awesome. Yeah. That reminds me of uh, Adam Wainwright was closing out a game. Huh. I think huh. it was NLCS. It may have been the World Series. And he's, his comments on it was, Isringhausen won the game for us. Well, Isringhausen was hurt. He wasn't, he wasn't even playing. And the interviewer, the reporter's like, what are you talking about? And he goes, he told me to breathe. Yeah. What are you talking about? Right. And he goes, well, I go out there in the ninth, I come out of the bullpen, I'm all fired up and I can't think anything. It's all. Yeah. Yeah. The stadium, the fans, everything's coming in. It's so loud. And I got to throw a pitch. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And then I remembered what is he said. I remember what is in your house said. And I stopped, turned around, took a breath, enjoyed all the sounds and changed the thought, changed the focus, changed yeah. the mindset. He goes, and then I was locked in. I couldn't hear a single thing. And it was just me and a catcher's glove. There wasn't even a batter. <laughs> so you nailed it. He went right into zone. He went right into a place, the state of flow. And I call it what I call getting into the zone. It's where you can be, you can stand on the mound in a playoff game with a sold out crowd, standing on their feet, waving towels, screaming at the top of their lungs, and you hear nothing. But if you hear it as like he said, coming in and the stadium and this, and you hear it all, it's like, man. Uh, and for him to be able to breathe and get conscious and understand he's like boom right to a state of flow now make a bit and by the way that guy how do you don't you just love i mean what a champion by the way i mean unbelievable he, just he's a, i mean awesome champion you know just an awesome champion yeah how do you get up there at his age that he's played so many games and keep flinging a curveball warrior he's a warrior man I love him. And he's a, you want to, he's now there's a bull. Yeah, absolutely. If you can get him on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, man. You want to talk about a bulldog and a gamer and someone who is, you know, when he takes that mound, he's ready. He's given it everything he's got in his preparation. 
um, if you're going to go to war, you know, take him with you. Yes. <laughs> if you, because listen, if you die in war, he's bringing you back. You know <laughs> that about that guy. And yeah. listen, I don't even know him personally, but I can just tell and watch and listen to his interviews, watch how he competes. He could play on my team anytime. So he yeah. had a Bible in a year thing. He invited everybody to jump on Twitter with him oh, and well, walk through well. Bible in a year. He'd put the verses out there. He'd read them and then he'd put his comments on Twitter. So you could just follow along with them. And so some people in public are one way privately, like you mentioned, are different yeah. and monsters. Adam's Adam's Adam. He just is yeah. who he is. Yeah. I got to go bowling with him and his wife and his daughters one day. It wasn't just me and them. It was a whole bunch of people, but I, I got to be in the lane and Yachty even showed up that day, which Yachty doesn't go to public events ever or yeah. private big yeah. events. He goes to small, yeah. <laughs> but it was so cool to get to see Adam relate with his wife and his four daughters, you know, tall string beans, of course, you know, you so see awesome. that love and caring and everything. It was just amazing. You know, what's so awesome is like, here's, here's a man that, loves the Lord and has given his life to Christ and warrior. Yes. People get this misconception that you're supposed to be soft. You're not soft. <laughs> We're going to go play a game. I'm coming. Like I'm coming to get you, <laughs> you know, and it's kind of <laughs> like, it's not soft. It's, it's playing with integrity. Yeah. But all out, like all out. Like, I'm going to play hard today. Like, as a Christian, I'm coming after you. Do you understand? <laughs> We're going to compete. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to lay it all out there. And I mean to tell you, I'm going to leave every ounce of my effort on that field. So good luck. That, that is about being a warrior, man. Right? And it's like, people get the misconception. It's like, oh, he's... He's soft or this, that. Look at Adam. Tell me he's soft. <laughs> you know, and, and it's like, you know, so, you know, it's just so awesome. And, and I love seeing that too. I love, uh, by the way, I love seeing and understanding those people and to see the bulldog in them out there. It's like game on. Let's like, we're going to war. Let's go, guys. And when you have an attitude like that, whoever you're competing against, whether it be in a, baseball game or whatever it is or just in life or at your job site whatever it is other people around you either want to link up and be your teammate and help you achieve the goal or if you're actually competing against them they shrink away yeah they yeah. see that and they get afraid and they they back away and it's it's awesome having that confidence in yourself listen to this day i have a five-year-old daughter so i i got listen okay i'm 55 and and people are like, you got a five-year-old daughter, you're 55. I see, yeah, I don't quit anything I believe in, first of all. All right. I go, I got a, I got a five-year-old. I have a 15-year-old son. I got an 18-year-old daughter, 19-year-old daughter, 25-year-old daughter. I got them from five to 25. Now, listen, my five-year-old is competitive. My, comp she is like, she's relentless, right? And she'll play, I, she would, dad, let's play games. She want to play games. Oh, Look, I want everyone to hear this loud and clear. I do not let her win anything I compete against. Now, you, some people are going to be like, geez, Todd, like, take it easy. <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 no. Listen, if I'm competing against my five-year-old, I'm playing to win. By the way, she's also playing to win. And here's what's important. And I'll, I'm going to tell you something that's crazy. We play a lot of card games. She wins most of the time. But it's not because I let her win, because I am not letting her win. And here's what I would tell you is like, what would I teach her by letting her win all the time? What would I teach her by her never failing at five? Let me tell you something. The child that I got to, that I'm raising, if I don't let her fall at five, she ain't going to know how to fall at 25. <laughs> So let me tell you something. If I'm competing against my five-year-old, I'm sorry if this offends people. I'm playing to win. See, and, and then if I beat her, I want to teach her. I want to teach her um, that it's not to destroy her. 
I want to teach her that she can learn from it, grow from it, become better from it, become a better com competitor because of it. But be a champion, win or lose, be a champion because you play the game the best you can. It's like, look, so many times we're protect, protect, protect. It's like, I remember when I taught her to ride a bike and it was like she could only do a couple pedals after we took the training wheels off. And, and it was like, and then she would fall. And, and my wife would say, you, you're not, you, you weren't there to catch her. I'm like, honey, we got to let her fall. And she's like, okay, you're right. You're right. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> it's powerful. It's pow if, we, if we don't let them fall at five, they're not going to know how to handle it at 25, 35, 45. I want, them to, I want her to learn. Let me tell you something. When you fall, you learn. Think about it. When you're a baby, I, I, I mean, have you, have you ever witnessed a baby trying, quitting on walking because they keep falling? No, they keep getting back up and they take some steps and then they fall, yes. they get back up, they take some steps. So at five, if she falls on her bike, am I supposed to make sure she never falls on her bike? No. Listen, what? You got to learn. You got to fall in order to grow. And ever and 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 in in order to grow, to learn, in order to survive, you must understand how to fall and get back up. So, I know, like you know, even my son, he's 15. If we compete, and it's like, I'm not, I'm not letting him win at anything. <laughs> And uh, it's, oh, that's really fun at 15. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and, <laughs> he's coming you know, up thinking he's something. Hey, I've taken him to batting practice and, and hitting in the cages and like he'll tee off and he'll kind of look at me and I'm like, all right, I'm, hey, the next one is chin music, right? It's like, <laughs> hey, you know, because look, at the end of the day, it's like, you're, you're not, look, you can go take me deep, but you, you're not going to act up or I'm coming to get you, son. <laughs> And, and it's like, it's all part of the process, right? I know people, people that aren't aware of the baseball code. This is totally the way you're supposed to yeah. do it. You know, I remember what, uh, uh, I remember a guy told me one time, they said, man, if you pitched against your mother, you'd knock her down. I said, if she was on the other team, I probably would. <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, but you play the game the right way, you know, and, and also in life, you know, so I know, don't get me, don't get me wrong. I'm, Every time my child falls, I'm there. I'm going to help them. Yes. I'm going to put my arm around them. But I'm not going to stop them from the fall because it's necessary for growth. See, failure, in order to succeed, you must fail. You must fail in order to su succeed. Everyone in the Hall of Fame Every major league hitter in the Hall of Fame had failed more times than they succeeded. In life, we need to stop trying to keep ourselves from failing and take it on more so we can learn more, so we can succeed more. I love that Derek Jeter, all-time hits leader for the New York Yankees. I love that he got 3,000 hits. I also love that over 7,000 times he failed to achieve the results of getting 3,000 hits. And it's like, if you think about that perspective, now falling, failing, setback, tragedy, all of these things, wow, it's good for us if we'll give it the right perspective, we'll stay in action, we don't quit, just means we get to go a little bit higher up the mountain on the rebound. It's powerful. Powerful. See so you've got a few things. You got two books, Relentless Success. So if you guys haven't heard the relentless in Todd's voice, Relentless yeah. Success, yeah. and the Observer. The Observer just it's a it's a fable story about mastering your emotions. If you guys haven't ever read a fable story, it's teaching parables. It's an amazing way to, to learn lessons and, and super easy read. So highly encourage you guys to check out the observer for sure. Thank you for that. You know, what's funny is like Jesus came to earth in our form and 
all he did was go village to village telling stories. Yeah. It's power in the story. He told stories and asked questions, told stories yeah. and asked questions. Yeah. Just what a, you know, and, 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 you know, for me, the, the, the story of both books was um, when I was in a bad place. Um, but I had a group of people, relentless success was all about, you know, this nine step formula to major league achievement. And each one of those steps I failed at miserably, but I had someone around me that helped me with that one step, get to the next step. It's funny when I finished writing the book, I didn't realize I had a nine step program, but it was the nine. It ended up being like this nine, nine innings. step process <laughs> of. Yeah, these are the things that you're going to go through. So it's kind of like when someone has a vision, they have a goal, they have a dream. Here's the starting line. Here's the vision. Here's the starting line. Here's what they they picture. And and here's the finish line. Well, everything in between, I call the gap. You can go through the ups, up, the ups and downs between the start of the vision and the achievement. That gap, <laughs> that 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 everything that's in that gap you're going to other people's opinions are going to show up in the gap uh, you're going to feel like quitting inside that gap you're going to be disappointed inside that gap you're going to fail like crazy inside that gap you're going to have days where you feel like i got this inside that gap you're going to have another day where you run up against a wall in that gap you're going to have people oppose you in that gap it's going to be harder in that gap it's going to take longer in that gap than you ever thought when you first started to take the step towards that vision it's that gap but it's going through the gap to achievement but what's more important that everything inside that gap is the nine steps is relentless success but everything in there is is the importance of that gap is who you become see i i have a belief today that everything's possible because when I was ready to walk away from the gap, when I was a, when I was, when I was, when I was um, I was so close to walking away from the game, but because I didn't, I just went to another place in the gap. And because I came out the other side of it, I'm like, oh dear Lord, the time when you feel like quitting is the time you're the closest to hitting the goal ever in your walk. You're just not aware of it. And most people quit right before they're going to succeed. And in my lifetime, in 1989, when I got sent down for the second time, I almost walked away. What I couldn't see was 30 days later, a 15-year major league career. <laughs> I couldn't see world championship teams. I couldn't see playing for the St. Louis Cardinals. I couldn't see sitting on a bench next to Willie McGee and Ozzie Smith. Huh. I couldn't visualize that. See, I was ready on a walk away, but because I took another step 30 days later, 15 year major league career. But I always say to people, but when I was the most vulnerable, what if I would have walked away? Would I believe everything is possible today? Probably not. What story could I possibly tell you about overcoming failure today? Probably not much of one. You see, it, it's like you just got to keep chiseling away at that wall like a water on rock. You just got to keep going. You just got to. And as long as in your heart that desire is there and comes from God above, you just got to keep going, man. Because you're, you're, once again, it, it's not happening to you. It's happening for you. I was getting sent down. It was happening for me, not to me. <laughs> and... Uh, I just look back and, and the other piece that I'll add to that in closing is if we look back in our life, the hardest times turned out to be the greatest blessings. So when you're having a hard time today, just, just remind yourself, man, this is, this got a chance to be a great, this is going to probably be one of my greatest blessings, this tough time. And that perspective, that switch is like that different perspective is just a different place to, to learn from and to grow from. So pretty awesome. For the people that just heard that and said, no way, that sounds too hard. I can't do that. Or any of those kind of thoughts, those negative yeah. thoughts, those limiting thoughts, FYI, 
try it once yeah. with a little bit of practice of trying, it becomes a lot easier and starts to be your go-to move instead. Yeah. You know, the other thing with that, what you said, is that you said something so profound. It's like, they said it's going to be too hard. Well, isn't it hard where you are? <laughs> yes. Like, Hold on a minute. Which one's more difficult <laughs> and which one's more painful? And by the way, which one comes with regret in your yes. life? Yes. Oh. So it's going to be hard no matter what. It's like I tell people, is it hard being broke? Hard. Is it hard being financially free? It's hard. <laughs> is marriage hard? It's hard. Is divorce hard? It's hard. Is getting in the best shape of your life hard? It's hard. Is being unhealthy and unfit hard? It's hard. <laughs> See, pick your hard. It's going to be hard. It's yes. meant to be hard and it's supposed to be hard. Let's get over this easy instant gratification that everything is supposed to be just great every day. It's supposed to be hard. It is, it is. And it's awesome when you've like achieved something and become, you know, bigger and better. And uh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned earlier, Christians and strength put the two together. That's what God's plan is. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that's so right. good. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your time so, so much. You've got the books out there. You've got, you've got a community too, I think. Yeah. So, you know, I have a, I have a monthly coaching thing I do with some entrepreneurs and stuff. Once a month, I go on live through zoom and people all over the country and we created a cool thing. So you know, that's cool. You can, you can see it on my website at toddofficial.com and you can come check it out. Um, uh, listen, I'm not here to sell anything. Um, you know, I am only, I am Todd's awesome. Um, and I try to put a video out on Facebook every single day and with no attachment to it. Uh, it's not a funnel. It's not trying to lead you anywhere. It's just, my thoughts and and I try to put out a three minute video and a lot of times they they show up on Instagram or Facebook or um you know and that sort of thing and and it's just you know my and and it's always me sharing something I had to overcome and then I get to share a little bit of the experience and then hopefully get you to think and see if you can grab something from it and then go achieve something with it and, or become better because of it so I, you know it's my way to serve we've been blessed man um, you know, dozens of times over and over and over. And we're so grateful for it. And, and I look for places and our family looks for places today is where, where can we serve? Where, where can we do something good? And where can we be helpful to, to others? So. And it's so awesome to see your kids then replicate that. So what, what we do, our kids will do too. Yeah. Amen. People do what they see. Yep. So I didn't prep you for this at all. Uh, any parting thoughts or anything, any advice for guys? And then after that, if you come up with a challenge, we always like to have a weekly challenge for everybody. Yeah. So I, I, I would tell you that, uh, um, first of all, is like own your dream. You have to own it and you can't allow someone else to put a dream on you. That dream has to come from within you, that vision and, and to own it. And what I mean by own it is, is like, just go all out for it. And, and because if someone puts a dream on you, when times get tough, you'll bail on that dream. And then so many times people are saying, you know, Todd, I'm really good at this, but man, I just, I have a heart for that. I'm like, well, as you continue to do this, go, go work on this an hour a day and see where it becomes, you know? Um, so own, I would say own it. Number two is I would tell you is like, and don't give up on it as long as it excites you and you have vision for it and it comes from within i believe it comes from from above and he wants you to take the steps um the challenge i would leave with you today is to become the observer that's my challenge my challenge is to become the observer that before we react step back from it how am i thinking how do i feel is it positive? Is it negative? Is it going to help me? Is it going to help me go where I need to go? And, and, I, and I always tell people nothing's neutral. 
whatever I do is either helping me get closer to where I want to go or it's keeping me from where I want to go. Be my challenge is over the next seven days is to become the observer. And before we react, step back, analyze how we think, and then become a better responder, not just a reactor. Um, I will give you the seven day challenge that uh, every time I have a negative thought, I give you another one. And every time I have a negative thought, and as you are aware of that negative thought, think 180 degree mindset. What's opposite of that negative thought? It's going to land you in positive territory. And just the awareness and clarity around these thoughts, then it begins to be a process. And let me tell you something, it is so much fun. And look, there are times like during the day, I'm like, geez, I got some negativity going through my mind. Like time out, like, let me replace this. And let me get refocused because wherever you focus, that's where your energy goes and where your energy flows is, you know, is, is where your life's going to end up. So, you know, as I, would, I say be cautious, but seven day challenge, 180 degree mindset. I love it. Become the observer, own your dreams and never give up. That's fantastic. Love the challenge. And I, I just remembered randomly a quick, funny thing. So you and your dad, families in that winter storm, the trees are falling. Totally made me think about Jesus and the apostles in the boat. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Jesus, <Yeah>. wake up. <laughs> yeah, like, wake up. I was like, why? <laughs> We're good. <laughs> oh, well, I appreciate your time so much. And uh, guys, engage that challenge. It's so awesome to just observe and then come up with something. Ask yourself a question, journal, figure out a way to respond in a better way for now and then also for the next time make such a difference in your life. Can I leave you with a closing scripture? Please do. Please. I want to go back to, because we had this conversation prior to going live. Yeah. Right? Yeah. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has even imagined what God has prepared for you. For those who love them, First Corinthians two nine. First so Corinthians two it's nine. So cool. It's like, look, it's beyond our imagination what's possible. It's beyond our sight what's possible. <laughs> it's beyond. It's beyond what we hear, what we see, what we feel, what we can imagine. What's possible for every single one of us, man. So, listen, brother. Uh, I appreciate you reaching out to me. Uh, it's been, it's been fun. It's been a, look, I'm, I'm honored and humbled that, that we got connected and I got a chance to come on and hang out with you. You're doing great stuff. And I'll just say, God bless, man. And thanks. Yeah, for I appreciate that so, yeah. so much. And yeah, God put this on me. God said, start this podcast. And That's I so just told my, my buddy, my mentor, I said, what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to start a podcast. And hours later I'm praying and God says, I want to talk to you about something. <laughs> Yeah. we're talking about your podcast and i was like no not my podcast you you heard me just say i wasn't doing it yeah, <laughs> he says yeah exactly. you're right i heard you so anyway <laughs> exactly i said all right we're gonna figure this out so that's that's where this came from so when you're talking about vision and going all out yeah awesome hey um it's all good Absolutely. Well, I appreciate it. We'll shut the recording down, say goodbye to the audience, and encourage you guys to engage this challenge. This one's a life-changing challenge. It certainly changed Todd's life. And in a similar activity for me, it changed my life also. So this will change your life as well. Thank you, guys.